our new uh, sports medicine surgeons here at Rothman Orthopedics. She started with us this past summer, but has tons of wonderful experience. She is a board certified uh, orthopedic surgeon specializing in sports related injuries of the knee, shoulder, and elbow. Um, you know, and I will let her kind of go over a little bit of where she studied and what she's what she's interested in, and we can take it from here, Dr. Bishop. Thanks, Kristen. Thanks, everybody, for joining us on this Wednesday evening. Um, so, you know, again, I'm talking on knee pain today. Um, I'm going to go through everything from uh, therapy to surgery with some of the most common causes of knee pain that we see. Um, I practice, you know, as Kristen said, I'm new to South Jersey, but I actually practiced for Rothman in New York City for a, a little while prior to this before moving back here. I'm from, originally from um, the outside Philadelphia area in PA side. So we were coming back to this area to be a little bit closer to family. Um, but either way, I practice in Marlton and Washington Township now. Um, and a little bit more about my background. I'm a sports medicine surgeon. Uh, so that's one of the cool things about being a sports medicine surgeon is you get to take care of a lot of athletes. And uh, that's a really great part of my practice. Um, I took care, I, I, I did my fellowship uh, for sports medicine at Hospital for Special Surgeries. So I was in New York for a few years there to took care of the Knicks, took care of Iona while I was up there. And just for this recently, this weekend, I went back up to New York City to cover the uh, pro athletes for the New York City Marathon. Um, so one of the really great parts of the, being about a sports medicine surgeon is taking care of uh, our athletes, but also, you know, love taking care of the weekend warriors and any, any active uh, people that end up having knee pain. Um, so our talk today, uh, here's kind of just a brief background of what we're going to cover. Uh, so first I'll go through some brief background and anatomy of, you know, the causes that things that could cause knee pain, um, in the knee. Um, then we're going to go through some of the most common causes of knee pain that we see, um, meniscus tears, runner's knee, uh, or patellofemoral pain syndrome. IT band syndrome and knee arthritis. So we talk about knee pain, it's incredibly common, especially amongst active people and really um, amongst sedentary people as well. Um, it affects up to 25% of US adults and re really it can be higher than that. Um, and prevalence is higher with our increasing age groups and is highest for our uh, over 75 group. And it's actually more commonly reported in women, especially in the patellofemoral or knee pain joint. When we look at the knee, there's a number of different things uh, that can cause knee pain. So we want to look at the anatomy or the structure of the knee. So this can be broken down into muscles and tendons, cartilage that lines the joint, the bones of the knee, the nerves that are around the knee, the blood supply to the knee, as well as all the ligaments of the knee. So when we're looking further, we look at the bones of the knee. The knee is made up of your femur, your kneecap, and your tibia, and the fibula is around the, is there as well. And then there's a number of ligaments uh, and uh, cartilaginous structures that make up your knee that can lead to knee pain. Um, our ligaments include our ACL and our PCL, and those are the two ligaments that cross inside of the knee and help stabilize your knee. We also look at our um, MCL and our LCL, uh, which are ligaments that are outside of the knee that also provide stability. And then we look at our meniscus. So the meniscus are these two C-shaped pads that line the inner and the outer portion of the knee that help kind of act as shock absorbers or help cushion the knee as well. And those certainly can be causes of knee pain. And then finally, the articular cartilage, which is the nice smooth cartilage that lines your, both your femur, your patella and your tibia um, that helps the joints glide nicely. And then when it starts to degenerate, that's when you get arthritis. So first we'll talk a little bit more about those shock absorbers or those meniscus, um, meniscal pads with meniscus tears. So what exactly is the meniscus? So these are C-shaped cartilaginous pads that again, act as shock absorbers and kind of help distribute forces through the knee so that it's not going through the cartilage or the bone. Um, the actual like structure, um, when you feel the meniscus, is very tough and rubbery uh, and, and quite strong. Um, and they work to help cushion the joint. So when you look at this picture here, so this is an example of an arthroscopic picture of the knee. The top is um, the femur, the bottom is your tibia, and then inside this um, area is the medial meniscus um, that kind of looks like this C-shaped structure. So when you have a meniscus tear, what kind of symptoms do you experience? So meniscus injuries can happen uh, in two different kind of ways. They can happen after an acute injury, such as like a twisting motion to the knee that leads to pain and injury to the meniscus, but they also can be kind of more wear and tear with time or degenerative type tears. Um, Usually you describe pain that's either on the inner portion of the knee or the outer portion of the knee, and it's aggravated by activity. Um, it's particularly like twisting or pivoting type activities. The pain is often um, point tender. So 
you know, more generalized knee pain or kind of when people point to their knee and they're like, oh, my whole knee hurts, you know, with your hand, that's usually not meniscal pain. It's usually pain where you can actually take your finger and you can put it on the spot and you say it hurts right here. That's usually meniscus pain. Um, it can come with stiffness and swelling. So especially in our acute meniscal injuries, the knee often will swell. Um, so usually if your knee swells up big or you get fluid or water on your knee, it, it means you did something in there. So that definitely can signify you could have a meniscal injury. And usually that swelling will lead to stiffness. And you can also get catching or locking. So the meniscal tears, um, when you tear that kind of tough uh, rubbery um, structure, the piece sometimes can, you can actually feel the piece catching inside the knee, or even if it's a big enough piece, sometimes they can displace and actually inhibit your motion or make you get uh, essentially not be able to fully straighten or fully bend the knee. And this picture kind of shows where your joint line is. So this would be kind of signifying where you would have pain for a medial meniscal tear. So how do we diagnose these meniscus tears? So first we always uh, examine the patient. So for a clinical exam, we're looking for swelling. We're looking for a joint line tenderness. And then we have specific tests that we'll do. So this picture at the bottom shows kind of, um, it's called McMurray's test, where you're essentially twisting the knee um, and rotating it to be able to see if that allows that meniscus to catch or click. After we are suspicious that there could be a meniscus tear, we'll get more further uh, imaging. So we always start with x-rays in the office and the x-rays will tell us if there's any kind of arthritis that could be causing the, the symptoms, if there's any alignment issues to the lower extremity and ruling out if there's anything like a fracture that could have occurred, especially if it's in a traumatic injury. These patients though, you know, we will always send for MRI. So an MRI is our definitive diagnosis for a meniscus tear. Um, these are pictures of looking at your knee from the front all the way to the right. And this is the knee from the side. Um, this shows a meniscus tear here. So your meniscus looks like a black, essentially we say it looks like a black bow tie on MRI. When you have a white streak that runs through the meniscus, that's going to signify that there's a tear there that's fluid that's getting into the meniscus from the tear. So that's what we look for when we're looking for a tear. So there's a number of different types of meniscus tears and the way the, the type of tear matters with how we're going to treat the meniscus tear. So there are different types of tears that we see more frequently related to injuries, um, such as like an acute injury. So these bucket handle tears where you could actually, here's a picture of this here. And this is actually an example of what a bucket handle tear looks like um, in surgery um, is where you actually flip a flap of the meniscus. And we also see these types of tears in conjunction with ACL tears. Um, those types of tears usually can lead to a block to motion. And we pretty much always operate on them either to remove the piece if, if it's in an older patient or to actually fix and suture the piece back together. And this is an example of that meniscus with sutures fixing that back together. Um, other types of tears that we can see are flap tears. Um, you can see radial tears and radial tears are essentially kind of like, um, I, I always show like tearing the edge of a piece of paper, which is kind of just a, a split in the, the meniscus. A lot of times we don't fix the radial tears unless they're big enough to kind of almost compromise the meniscus um, just because they, the early, the inner tears don't always heal as well. Um, and then we also talk about degenerative meniscus tears. So these degenerative tears we see very frequently. Um, these are tears that are often associated with um, arthritic change. So these are kind of the more insidious onset of pain rather than acute injury you say your knee has been hurting for a few years. You don't know exactly what happened. Um, and this is often kind of re related to wear and tear with time. The cartilage is a, a, with age and with use will thin and weaken over time. Um, and this age worn tissue is going to be more prone to tear. Um, these kind of show the example at the bottom of what some degenerative type meniscus tears look like with fraying. Um, they're kind of complex in multiple different directions. Um, and the way we treat these tears are slightly different than those injury, the more acute injury prone tears. One other final type of tear to mention uh, is the meniscus root tear. So these are another special type of tear that we will actually so, sometimes recommend surgery, even for a patient that's in their 60s. So these tears are the actual attachment site of the meniscus is torn off. So when this happens, the meniscus isn't able to function as well and really doesn't work as well because one whole attachment site is torn off. Uh, and what we see with this, if you leave it, sometimes the patient can get arthritis in a much more rapid fashion. So a lot of times we will actually operate and fix these meniscus tears uh, with sutures, which can be seen down here, even if it's a, an older patient uh, with a mildly degenerative knee. 
the more degenerative knees, it generally d doesn't help as much, but the whole idea of fixing these types of tears is to prevent that rapid progression of arthritis. And patients can have very good results with this surgery. So when we talk about treatment and how we make that decision, um, you know, for some meniscus tears, non-operative treatment is appropriate. This is starts with activity modification. So obviously resting um, to allow it to the acute inflammatory phase to calm down. Anti-inflammatory medications can be helpful. Physical therapy to be able to help regain motion and help kind of strengthen the muscles around the knee. They can also do modalities to help improve the inflammation of the knee, things like ice and stimulation of the quad. Um, and a lot of times a corticosteroid injection can be a very powerful anti-inflammatory to help take pain down. These are appropriate for you know, smaller meniscus tears, um, some of the degenerative type tears that won't necessarily improve with surgery. Uh, this is a good first step. And patients that um, have these meniscus tears, especially if they're not undergoing surgery, a lot of times the question is, can I keep working out? Can I keep doing the things I want to do? Um, so, you know, the answer to this is it depends on the type of tear and the location of the tear, and it depends on your symptoms. But a lot of times, yes, um, you can keep working out with these meniscus tears. Um, I generally, you know, this is, I show this example because I think that this was maybe two or three years ago and Bede um, tore, I believe his lateral meniscus in the playoffs. And the question was, can he play through it? And he did sort of play through it. it uh, he usually gets injured in the playoffs and doesn't make it very far, but um, he, he did play, uh, you know, finish out the season uh, and they got surgery after the end of the season. So you can play through this. You know, I usually say, you know, if you're, um, pain is getting worse. Um, if you're getting worsening swelling, um, those are signs to look out for that you may be doing too much. Um, but for some certain meniscus tears, you can continue to work out. And this would be appropriate question um, for your orthopedist um, to, to know. And then finally, the surgery um, is uh, an obvious treatment for meniscus tears as well. And it, when we perform surgery for meniscus tears, we either will repair the tear or we trim it uh, back to a stable surface. So again, it depends on the type of tear. It depends on the age group. Uh, it depends on the amount of arthritis. There's a number of factors that we look into to decide how to treat the meniscus tear. Um, but again, um, you know, we will weigh all of that in um, based on the MRI and kind of your symptoms. But most of those degenerative tears were kind of trimming the edges and cleaning up. The bigger, more acute uh, tears that could be associated with an ACL tear or that involve a large portion of the meniscus, we often try to fix those. And here's kind of an example um, of what an arthroscopic knee surgery looks like. Uh, this is a the video here is showing a shaver, and this is something that we use to trim down. This is here showing actually trimming down loose pieces of cartilage. Um, but this is an example of an instrument that we could use to be able to help um, trim down any kind of loose pieces of meniscus here. Uh, the picture on the left, um, this is again, you, your tibia is at the bottom, femur is at the top. And then the structure in the middle is your C-shaped meniscus. And this is called a biter. And that's something that we use to trim down the meniscus back to a stable surface as well. And our last picture at the bottom here shows um, the kind of a degenerative looking meniscus tear that's frayed on the inner rim. And then you can see after it's cleaned up um, back to a stable edge. So that's kind of what we try to achieve when we're um, fixing our meniscus. And then patients always ask, once my meniscus is gone, am I going to get arthritis? Um, so, you know, the, the answer to this is, uh, you know, degenerative tears are often associated with arthritis. So really, you know, so that meniscus is torn already. It's not necessarily functioning well. So I think for a lot of these degenerative tears, going in and cleaning up and trimming it isn't necessarily increasing your chances of getting arthritis too much, but it needs to be the right indication. If you already have a good amount of arthritis in the knee and going in and trying to trim it can actually make your, your symptoms a little bit worse. Um, so it's not necessarily always a good idea to do that. Um, if you do remove a very large piece of meniscus, um, definitely you can have an increased chance of arthritis. And that would be with some of those like bucket handle tears and things like that, or those meniscal root tears that we talked about. Um, but uh, generally when we do our surgeries, we always try to save as much meniscus as possible to be able to help preserve that uh, and keep the patients at their best function. Uh, so that wraps up meniscus tears. Um, I'm going to move on to uh, our second um, very frequently um, seen um, causes of knee pain, which include runner's knee or patellofemoral pain syndrome. And you certainly don't need to be a runner to have this symptom, but that's kind of just the general colloquial term for it. Um, so patellofemoral pain syndrome is softening of the articular cartilage that's underneath the kneecap. Um, and it's actually, there's really nothing structurally wrong inside the knee, meaning there's not like a tear 
Um, there's nothing that if we got an MRI, you know, we would need to go in and fix with surgery initially. It's, it actually just causes inflammation of kind of the lining, which is called the synovium of the knee. And then it's going to cause pain in that anterior or front of the knee under the kneecap. And a lot of times this is related to your kneecap, not tracking properly, um, where it sits in, in the groove, which can be seen here. And then maltracking of the kneecap isn't, like I said before, necessarily anything structurally wrong inside your knee. It has to do with some weakness and muscle imbalance of all the muscles that support that kneecap. Um, and that will lead to that inflammation and pain. So the symptoms of this uh, patellofemoral pain syndrome is uh, pain in the front of the knee or in the anterior knee. And this picture kind of just shows that uh, the red lines of around where we're um, speaking about. Um, you, people can describe getting some like popping or cracking sounds with the kneecap when it moves. Um, and that can, the more the inflamed the knee is, the more often you can get those kind of cracking and popping sounds. Um, you can have pain, especially after sitting for a prolonged period with your knees bent. When your knee is bent, that's when that kneecap is engaged in, in the uh, trochlea, which is kind of um, the patellofemoral joint. So you're putting the most pressure on the kneecap then. So when you go up to stand, it's very uncomfortable. And patients often note too pain with going down, going up and down stairs. So again, that's when your knee is bent and you're putting pressure on that and you're actually engaging your quad, uh, which is attached to that kneecap. So that those are the motions that are going to cause the most pain. And usually people say going downstairs is worse than going upstairs. So how, what causes patellofemoral pain syndrome? Um, so often it's an overuse type injury. Um, this can be for people that are running a lot where it got its name runner's knee. It can be just from changing activity. A, a lot of people are doing a lot of squats, um, a lot more walking um, on an uneven surface. Um, sometimes it can even be from sitting longer. Like in, in COVID, I saw a lot of patellofemoral pain just from people sitting at, you know, at inappropriate desks for a long period of time. Um, so it's really just anything that's putting undue pressure of that patellofemoral joint. Um, there's some, you know, uh, anatomic features of people's knees that can predispose them to getting this, um, whether or not their kneecap kind of tracks laterally or to the outside of the joint, which is seen in this picture here. Sometimes patients have a high rating kneecap. It's something called patella alta, which we will identify in an x-ray, which can predispose you to having this problem. And then really one of the main factors, like I said before, is kind of looking at that muscle balance that's around that kneecap and sp supporting it. We often see very weak um, quadriceps, weak hip abductors and glutes, and very tight IT bands. And this can lead to maltracking of that kneecap and pain. And then finally, you know, we always look to see if there's some arthritic change underneath that kneecap, which can contribute um, to that anterior knee pain as well. How do we diagnose this? So first, uh, obviously clinical exam we start with. Um, so always a, a test for any kind of um, tenderness around the kneecap. So pushing on both the inside and the outside. I always test for something called um, crepitus, which is kind of um, noting to be any kind of crackling or crunching underneath the kneecap, um, any feelings of instability when the kneecap moves around. We look at the alignment of the lower legs. We look to see if there's any kind of changes in the arches of the feet, as that sometimes can put more pressure on the kneecap joint. Um, and then I always have a patient stand up like on a stool or try to do a squat just to assess uh, how well their quads and glutes are firing. Then we always get imaging. Um, we're looking at our x-rays for uh, ass assessing some of those anatomic features I talked about before, looking for arthritis. And then we can always get an MRI too uh, for further diagnosis for our real recalcitrant cases. I would tell you, we don't necessarily have to get an MRI for this diagnosis. It's really only if it does not get better with uh, many rounds of conservative management. Because like I said before, the MRIs don't necessarily show anything structural wrong. So how do we treat patellofemoral pain syndrome? Um, so first slide is always non-surgical treatment. Um, so the general rice, rest, ice, compression, elevation, um, anti-inflammatory medications, but the real like um, gold standard for treatment for this is physical therapy. And that's working on some of those uh, muscle imbalances th that we talked about before. So that's really focusing on strengthening your quadriceps, strengthening your glutes, strengthening your core and loosening up your IT bands to help that kneecap track better. Sometimes bracing or taping the kneecap can be beneficial to people as well. And then there always are injections like cortisone or gel shot injections that can be done if, you know, to help treat the pain and get the pain um, under control to be able to better do the physical therapy. Orthotics um, can be helpful in, um, in the shoes as well. Sometimes people with flat feet can be more predisposed to having anterior knee pain. So, you know, getting your foot assessed and trying uh, just even just an over counter the orthotic, I usually recommend super feet um, can be helpful too. And it's not like necessarily like 
something gets better in a week. You've got to give all these things at least six to eight weeks um, to even see if there's going to be improvement. So if you do get diagnosed with runner's knee or patellofemoral pain syndrome, patients always ask, can I still keep working out? Um, so again, generally, yes, I do avoid usually avoid to recommend avoiding those deep squatting exercises while you're inflamed because that does put more pressure on that joint. Um, and my golden rule is if it really hurts, you probably shouldn't do it. So just monitoring your symptoms, seeing what seems to really aggravate it. Um, as long as your pain is not increasing and you're not having increasing swelling, generally you can um, keep uh, working out. Um, the other thing you want to look out for is making sure you're not modifying your gait. If you are a runner and you're running through this, uh, you want to make sure you're not running in an awkward way that could injure something else. Um, and you should be being doing PT throughout throughout this. And as long as you continue to improve, you can continue to continue to push through it. Obviously, if it's too painful, you should take the time to rest. Um, there are surgical treatments for this. Um, you know, in sm small amount of cases, we will do uh, what's called an arthros well, arthroscopic surgery to go in if there are some kind of cartilage lesions that could be causing the pain, you go in and, and, and clean that up or perform a potential cartilage surgery. Um, and then the other surgery is a much larger surgery. It's called a tibial tubercle osteotomy. And this is done for um, kind of a recalcitrant pain that has some of the kind of anatomic features that we talked about that you know, could predispose you to the knee pain where you actually realign and move um, the kneecap by moving uh, the tibial tubercle where the patellar tendon attaches. Uh, that's a really, it's a large surgery. So it's something that we definitely reserve if you really don't get better with any of those conservative uh, measures. So the next is IT band syndrome uh, or iliotibial band syndrome. So your IT band is this fascial structure that runs all the way, and you can see on this picture here, all the way up from your hip, your iliac crest, and goes over um, your hip bone all the way down the outside of your leg and attaches on the outer portion of your knee to your tibia, just past your joint line of your knee. Um, this is a very common cause of pain on the outer portion of the knee or the lateral knee. Um, it can also cause pain in the thigh as well as in the hip too. Um, we see this commonly with patients that with recent uh, training changes and working out. I, I often see it in my runners when they're starting to taper for a race. Uh, you can see it in runners too when they're starting uh, to uh, begin a new training cycle as well. Um, it can be related to having weakness in your hip flexors as well as your hip abductors. And you can see it on patients that run a lot of hills as well or walk a lot of hills. On, the, on exam, these patients are going to be tender on the outer portion of the leg or on the hip and have a lot of tightness on stretch of the IT band, which can be seen here. So we treat IT band syndrome first, again, same type of uh, ideas, rest, anti-inflammatories, physical therapy uh, to work on strengthening the muscle imbalance, a lot of foam rolling and stretching. And in recalcitrant cases, you can perform an injection here as well. And I would prefer PRP or platelet-rich plasma, which is a biologic injection. I'll talk a little bit more about that later uh, for, for this type of problem. And if you do have IT band syndrome, can you still work out? And again, it's the same principles of really hurts. You probably shouldn't do it, but yes, you, as long as it's not causing too much pain and you're doing your therapy, you can continue to work through this. What's unique about IT band syndrome is you can really, really stretch the IT band and that does help get these symptoms better. So I say unlimited stretching to the IT band, keep foam rolling, uh, massage can be really helpful before working out, try to heat up the area, avoid hills, try to run on or walk on more flat surfaces make sure your shoes are updated and up to date. And then, you know, if you're not improving that, that would be an indication that you should rest or cross train. And then the last topic, which is our biggest topic is knee arthritis. So first, what is arthritis? So arthritis is when you lose uh, the nice smooth articular cartilage that lines your joints. And then you can see in these pictures, this picture here, um, this shows your, your femurs at the bottom and then your tissue, your, you can't really see your tibia actually, it should be below these inflamed tissues, but here's cartilage, which is the white, the yellow is actually exposed bone. So that's when you lose the nice cartilage that lines the joint and you end up having kind of people talk about eventually getting that bone on bone component. Um, it causes inflamed tissues and it causes pain. And then this is an area of a focal car cartilage defect. 
So arthritis is a very big problem. It's the number one cause of chronic disability in the United States. And by 2030, the number of adults that are affected with arthritis is, is, is going to be, you know, over 60 million or 25% of the adult population. What causes arthritis? So primary arthritis can be caused just by general aging. Um, our cartilage with age loses water and loses ability to be able to kind of repair um, and just becomes more unhealthy with age. Um, genetics, some people are more predisposed to having cartilage issues than others and arthritis. A lot of people will be like, oh, my mom and dad had it. So, so you know, you may be predisposed just based on genetics alone. And there can be secondary causes of arthritis. It can come from obesity. Um, it can come from traumatic injury to the knee, um, which is a very common cause as well. Symptoms of arthritis include, of course, pain. Uh, it gets worse with prolonged use, stiffness in the knee. Um, it's a really common cause, a common complaint with people that are arthritic. Um, it's worse actually after you've been sitting and for prolonged periods of inactivity. You can get periods of swelling with arthritis as well, or feeling like there's fluid on the knee. Um, and then people sometimes describe like an uneven grating or catching sensation uh, with movement in the knee. And that's from those rough uh, cartilaginous surfaces. And how do we diagnose arthritis? So we always start with x-rays again. And here on x-rays, we're looking for this joint space. So we can see the picture on the left with the blue arrows that shows a normal knee joint space. And then you can see to the right with the red arrows, you can see the complete loss of joint space where you're getting the bone on bone components. And this is a picture of looking at that patellofemoral joint or kneecap joint. You can see the bone on bone components there as well. So when we treat arthritis, the treatment is kind of a latter approach to treatment. Treatment is going to vary with the amount of severity of the arthritis and symptoms. So our first step kind of on this ladder that can help you, you, you want to try to live with the pain and be able to manage your symptoms. Um, so the first things that you can do to manage your symptoms, I always tell patients, the only thing that you can do yourself to be able to prevent arthritis from getting worse and your symptoms from getting worse are to number one, try to stay active. Um, so keep exercising, low impact exercise is going to be the best thing for your knees. Um, that's, you know, biking, that's, you know, walking, that's um, using the elliptical, things like that, getting in a pool. So low impact exercise and keeping those knees moving is really good um, for your knees. And that also helps with weight management. Um, so reducing uh, your weight or weight loss has been shown to reduce osteoarthritis symptoms up to 90% in several studies. And for every pound excess weight the patient is, that's four pounds on the knee. So that's just one thing to keep in mind. That's really the only things that you can personally do to keep your knee healthy. Um, physical therapy can be beneficial too, uh, to help strengthen kind of the muscles around the knee and better support it. So then, you know, what can we do? We can do things to help control inflammation and pain. So the kind of the first rounds of step for that are just oral medications. We recommend anti-inflammatory medications. Tylenol arthritis can be helpful. Some people will take glucosamine chondroitin sulfate, uh, which is uh, a supplement you can buy at CVS that's known to help for joint health. We do not recommend taking narcotic pain medications for arthritis as this is a chronic condition. Um, and certainly it, it, narcotics don't necessarily always help with arthritic pain very well either. And then we also have injections to offer. And there's a number of different injections to offer that can treat arthritis. Um, cortisone or a steroid injection can be very helpful. It's a very powerful anti-inflammatory um, it can provide pain relief, you know, for months. Um, the kind of downsides of the cortisone is the more often you do it, kind of the less it, effective it becomes. And it's also not great for your tissues to do too frequently. So we generally don't recommend you do a cortisone injection more frequently than once every three to four months. Um, we also have something called visco supplementation injections or gel shot injections. These are made up of something called hyaluronic acid, uh, which is a more naturally occurring of substance in the knee that kind of adds to the viscosity or thickness of the synovial fluid. These are just a number of different um, brands of this. You can kind of pick your poison. Uh, that, I don't know if there's any studies that show some work better than the other, but these generally come in a series of three injections. There are sometimes you can do it in one, one injection. Well, the downside of the one injection one uh, is that uh, oftentimes it's, a, it's more fluid going in. It can be a little bit more painful for patients. And then we also have biologic injections. So a lot of people ask about stem cells or platelet-rich plasma, things like that. So platelet-rich plasma, um, this is a picture at the below. This kind of shows what this is. So platelet-rich plasma is actually where we take your own blood in the office, and then we place it into something called a centrifuge, and it spins it down, and it kind of separates all the growth factors and platelets out. And then you inject that back into the knee. Um, this has actually been shown to be more effective at a year for pain than the gel shot injections. But we know that it doesn't 
It has not been shown to actually help regrow cartilage or kind of heal anything. It's really just treating pain. And that's actually the same with stem cells. So stem cells have been shown in some studies to be able to help control pain, but they're not regrowing cartilage. So they're not healing anything. So it's really just a very, very expensive uh, injection, uh, cortisone injection really at this point, because it's not treating, uh, it's not allowing you to regrow your cartilage. So you really need to be very careful um, with selecting these and make sure you have, do good research on it. Um, you know, in, in my toolbox at this point, I do offer plate, platelet rich plasma, usually after patients have failed a cortisone injection or failed a gel shot injection, um, because it is, it is an option that we have in our toolbox. It doesn't necessarily always work and it also is expensive. So, you know, I don't, I wouldn't offer it as a first line of treatment, but it certainly is something that we can use. Um, so when you do get arthritis, can you can keep being active? So yeah, like I said before, um, being active is very good for your knees. Lower impact activities are going to be better. So choosing those things that are not maybe racing a marathon anymore or uh, high impact cardio classes, uh, the more lower impact classes will be better. If you are a runner, you don't have to stop running. I never make people stop running, but I do say that probably running every day maybe isn't the best choice. You can try to start to incorporate some cross training uh, in, into your uh, workouts. Um, it will help you maintain a healthy weight and, uh, motion is lotion. Uh, and when I say motion is lotion, we actually have a number of studies that show healthy cartilage will adapt to higher repetitive loads during walking and actually increase thickness. So being active actually can make your cartilage healthier. And so finally we've reached our top of the ladder, uh, which is surgery. Uh, so there are a couple options for focal cartilage lesions or focal arthritic lesions um, for pre-joint replacement. And this is actually what I, I generally perform. These, these are for um, younger patients that have uh, focal lesions of cartilage that's not diffused throughout the knee. So these kind of are just one area of the femur um, that has, or the patella that has area uh, of cartilage degeneration. You actually can use something called an osteochondral allograft which means bone with cartilage on it to actually replace the bone and cartilage, um, which you can see here. Um, there's also something called Macy or matrix induced autologous chondrocyte implantation, which is a very long term. That's why we call it Macy, um, which is a two stage procedure where you actually go in and you harvest a small piece of cartilage from the patient's knee and it goes to a cell and it gets um, grown on a cartilage matrix, which is seen down here. And you can use that to kind of um, replace the cartilage and the, and the defect in a second stage procedure. Um, so in appropriate patients, um, these are very good options uh, for pre-joint replacement surgery in these focal cartilage lesions. There's also something called an osteotomy. Um, and this is an option for patients that have arthritis in one compartment of the knee. So there's really three compartments of the knee. There's your patellofemoral compartment, there's your medial compartment or inside and your lateral compartment. So if you have arthritis in just one compartment, say that you had some kind of injury that led to when you were younger, that led to arthritis uh, very bad just on one side, um, you could do an osteotomy, which is actually where you break and realign the bone to be able to open up that joint more. It's called a joint preservation procedure. Um, it's a very big recovery. It can be up to a year to recover. You're not in weight bearing for a long period of time. So again, this has to be a very specific, appropriate patient um, to undergo this. And you know, most of these patients will be undergoing a knee replacement at some point but the goal is to be able to prolong the lifespan of the joint. And then finally, the tip top of the ladder is knee replacement. Um, so you can do a partial knee replacement. You can do a complete knee replacement. Um, this, you know, the indications to, that you need a knee replacement are that you've got arthritis throughout the knee, increasing pain, increasing deformity. And you can see here, this patient's getting more bow-legged. Those are signs that the arthritis is getting worse um, and really based on function. So a lot of it is, can you still do the things you want to do? Can you still um, you know, live a functional life. And those are questions you have to ask yourself. Um, so kind of in summary, um, some general recommendations for knee pain, um, staying active is good for your long-term health. It's great for your knees. It's great for your cardiovascular health. Um, you know, when you have knee pain, you can find ways to tr try to try to find ways to be able to treat the pain and then be able to be active because that's only going to be able to help you longer in the future. Um, knowing your diagnosis, there's a number of different causes of knee pain, and there's a number of ones we didn't cover. Um, so being educated, seeing an orthopedist uh, can help you um, know how to treat it and how to move forward. Follow the golden rule uh, when approaching uh, exercise and approaching working out. Um, you want to, if it really hurts, you probably shouldn't do it. Watch for signs for worsening pain, worsening swelling. Those are signs that you probably shouldn't be doing the activity. 
um, know your options, both surgical and non-surgical. There's a number of treatment options that are include both um, for you know all of our knee pathologies, and know yourself. Like I said, um, you know you shouldn't have to live your life in pain for you know, forever. We do have good surgical treatments and non-surgical treatments for knee pain. So seeking out an orthopedist, if you do have knee pain, it can help, you know, keep you active and, and uh, keep you doing the things you want to do. Um, so that is my talk. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. I know that Kristen's going to be moderating them. So yeah, please feel, feel free to ask whatever you guys need to. That was so interesting. Thank you so much. Um, I do have a couple questions here, so I'll just try to go quickly so we can get through as many as possible. Um, what is gel and when is it used? I've heard it helps more than cortisone. So the, the gel or the visco supplementation injections are made of something called hyaluronic acid. Um, it's kind of a like a proteoglycan or like a thick viscous fluid that we have in our knee um, naturally. That So it's kind of adding that thick fluid back into the knee. It doesn't, and people kind of have the idea that it's like increasing the space or the cushion in the knee. It doesn't really do that. It, it really helps treat inflammation and pain. Um, so that's kind of the goal of it. The indications for the gel are if you have kind of mild to moderate arthritis generally is probably the best indication and the best, um, the you might have the best success with it. Really for the more severe arthritic pain, it, it probably doesn't work all that well. Um, in terms of cortisone, um, I actually think cortisone probably works better, at least for a powerful anti-inflammatory, at least at first. Um, it, the gel shots generally are a little bit more of a slow burn. They take all three injections to kind of help. Sometimes you feel a little bit worse after the first ones, and it takes a few weeks after you finish the series of three to feel better. Uh, but, but sometimes they can actually work longer than cortisone. So it really depends. I would say it's a little bit hit or miss. Some people are very good responders to the gel injections. Some people are very good responders to the steroid injection. In my algorithm, I usually will give a steroid injection first, and if those don't work, then I'll move on to the gel injections after. And what if somebody has had um, like a synvisc injection? Um, I have someone here that they had it seven or eight years ago. Um, when can you do it again? So you can do those injections once every six months. That's what they're approved by insurance uh, to be done once every six months. Perfect. Um, if there's surgery to repair a meniscus tear, is that previously injured tear more prone to re-injury? I would say yes, in general. Um, I mean, it, it depends. I guess we don't necessarily know how much the meniscus healed. Um, sometimes the meniscus may not fully heal, even if you had it previously repaired and it could be prone to re-tear. You don't, I guess we wouldn't know unless we got imaging or directly looked at it to assess if it fully healed. Um, so I would say probably just in the sense that meniscus doesn't always have the greatest healing uh, potential because it doesn't have great blood supply. Um, so, you know, if you do have a great repair and it heals very well, uh, I would say probably not in that case, but in a lot of cases, just the meniscus potential for healing isn't great because of the, because of the blood supply. So you might have a higher chance of retarium because of that, or just, it never probably fully healing and becoming symptomatic again at some point. So what would you say the, the success percentage rate of uh, repair would be? It depends on the type of repair. So that's, that's a good question, but I know that- A lateral have... meniscus tear to be specific. <laughs> so we're getting very specific. So, well, I can tell you for like a bucket handle lateral meniscus tear, we know based on looking at studies, it's about 80% success rate. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, is there any prospect for the use of stem cell injections to reverse arthritis in the knee? Not yet. People are working on that all the time, but we do not have any stem cells that will reverse arthritis in the knee yet. All that, like I said, all that we've ever shown stem cells to do at this point is to help pain. So it's a very expensive injection to help treat pain at this point. What about glucosamine? Does the over-the-counter glucosamine really work? And how long should you use it before you decide if it's working or not? Um, you know, I think there's some studies that have shown that glucosamine maybe helps with people feel like the joint motion better. Um, and maybe, um, you know, I always tell patients to give it about 50% chance of working. It might be a placebo effect. And that's why I say that. Um, but I would at least give it a few months. And then if it doesn't, you know, feel like you're getting any improvement, there's certainly no reason to continue it. Um, but I, I would give it at least 50% chance. 
What about acupuncture for knee conditions? Yeah, I think acupuncture is great. Um, it's certainly a, a good option that can help pain. It's not changing anything structurally, but it can certainly help treat symptoms of pain and inflammation. Um, I would say the downside of acupuncture is it, it's not long lasting. It can provide relief for a short period of time and you kind of have to continue doing it. Uh, but it definitely is a good option. Uh, I'm 51 and I played ice hockey for 40 years. I have bone on bone arthritis after full knee replacement. Will I be able to play ice hockey again? So I would say yes. Um, yeah, I would say yes. A lot of people are uh, being a lot more active. I know people that have run, gone and run marathons after a knee replacement at this point. Um, the more you do, you know, the more you're going to wear down your knee replacement. Uh, but we have really great knee implants, you know, these days that continue to improve. So um, people are, you know, being way more active um, after their um, knee replacements and their surgeries. So, you know, I would obviously discuss it with whatever surgeon is doing your surgery, but um, I, I think there's a very good chance you could go back to playing ice hockey. Um, and after knee replacements, um, this person still has severe tightness in both knees. Any suggestions? Hmm. Um, so there's a number of reasons that there could be some severe tightness. It could be if they were very tight beforehand, there could have been some, you know, um, contractures of the muscles and the tendons and things that surround the knee that just make it harder to get the motion back. Um, there could be some scar tissue that formed, um, it could have something to do with the sizes of the implants. There, there's a number of different reasons that can cause tightness. Uh, so I, you know, I would definitely, if that's the case, um, you know, I would talk to your surgeon about it and see if they want to explore, you know, other regions and treatment options. Um, the most simple thing you can do is try more physical therapy. Um, but uh, you know, there's so many reasons that could cause tightness. It's definitely something to talk to your surgeon about. Um, and this is a good question. I think a lot of people kind of go back and forth on this. Um, I've been told I have bone on bone arthritis and need a knee replacement. Should I wait until I can't stand the pain or get it done while I'm still relatively fit? So, I mean, our recommendation would be get it done while you're still relatively fit. Um, you certainly don't want to do it. You know, you don't want to spend, waste your years that you could be doing things because you're in so much discomfort where there's a lot of good options for treatment um, of pain and you can still be active after a knee replacement. Um, so, uh, you know, you should do, you obviously, you know, uh, depending on age, um, if you're very young, you probably want to wait, you know, under the age of 50, you probably want to try to push it off a little bit longer. Um, but, you know, anybody over the age of 50 or over, if you are having debilitating knee pain, it's definitely worth at least talking to an orthoplasty surgeon just to, to see your options um, and see if it fits with your lifestyle. Maybe we'll have time for just two more. Um... Could a small hairline fracture of the medial tibial plateau be worth fixing if there's also significant arthritis? Probably not. A small hairline fracture, it depends if it's, well, first of all, it depends if it's a traumatic fracture, meaning it occurred because you fell or something like that, or if it's just associated with arthritis, because sometimes you can get small hairline fractures that just come with having worsening arthritis. Those are called like subchondral insufficiency fractures. So, you know, there are some procedures that you can do for that, but oftentimes they get better just kind of with a period of non-weight bearing and rest. Great. And uh, one more. Um, are there any exercises to do to prepare for a full knee replacement surgery? Yeah. So, I mean, I always give all my patients a packet um, for knee exercises. Uh, you know, I, I don't know that I would give you any specifically over um, this talk right now, but if you want to look up online, there's a, you can look up AOS knee exercises, AAOS, and there's a lot of really good knee exercises on there. Um, so the more you do to prepare yourself prior to surgery, the better you're going to be and the more informed you'll be for your recovery. A lot of, and I know Rothman does this, that we have um, like nurse navigators and things like that, that it will prepare you with things that you need to do prior to surgery to have you better prepared after surgery. So there certainly are exercises um, that you could do. Um, and the more informed you are, the better for your recovery. All right. I know you have to run. Thank you so much, Dr. Bishop. I know there's still some questions in the chat. 
So um, if, if we didn't get to your question, please email it to me and we will work on getting you answers over the next few days. Um, again, this uh, talk is recorded and will uh, be sent out via YouTube, YouTube link um, by probably next Tuesday or so. Awesome. So again, thank you so much, Dr. Bishop. This was just really informative. It's always interesting and I love to see your babies. <laughs> Thanks everybody for um, calling in tonight. And um, yeah, like, like uh, Kristen said, I'm happy to answer more questions. Um, we'll try, we'll try our best to get back to everybody through email and um, yep. Yeah, please reach out if you guys need anything. Thanks again for calling in. All right. Good night.